Okay, um, we're continuing on with our study in the book of Romans. Last week we, um, we got down through, I believe, the first 12 verses of chapter 4. Um, where, we, where we were talking about, um, we talked about the sign that he received, the, we talked about the seal. You know, a sign is not a condition. A seal is something that declares something to be a fact. It's not a condition. Um, and so what he had received was a sign, and it talks about um, that he might be the, the father of all them uh, that believe and those that walk in the steps of Abraham. And I, I made the point that if you, if you have Abraham walking along the seashore, and you got a whole bunch of people walking along behind him, very careful to put their feet where Abraham put his feet. Well, that's the picture that we're looking at. God's children, when in fellowship with God, walk in the steps of Abraham. They look at what Abraham did and they do likewise. And, and I made the point that, that, that this is talking about Abraham believing God. And it was his belief of God that was counted to him as righteousness, okay? In other words, it's what showed him to be righteous, the fact that he believed God. And I made the point last week also that if you believe somebody, well then you're more apt to do what they tell you to do. If you believe them and you trust them and they say, you know, go catch that dog, you'll go catch the dog. You'll do what they ask you to do. And that's that's where you get the evidence that you're one of those that are walking in the steps of our father Abraham. Because when you see something in the Bible that says, do this, and you do it, that's evidence that you believed whoever it was that told you to do it to start with. Okay? And that's, so that's, that's, that brings us up to where we are today. Um, Verses 13 through 25, this is, uh, we're going to call this a picture of Abraham as the father of the believers. This section says this, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but that to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff in that passage. Um, and in this passage, again, we're, we're coming back to this idea that therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. What faith are we talking about? What faith have we been talking about since chapter 3 and verse 22? What faith brings the righteousness of God? If the righteousness of God comes by the faith of Jesus Christ, that's the faith we're talking about here. Not Abraham's faith. Abraham's faith showed that he was righteous. Christ's faith makes us righteous. So don't lose sight of that. We're still, we're still talking about the same we, thing we've been talking about. And a lot of people will jump to some of these verses and say, Aha, see there? See there? It's your faith. Well, there's no evidence that it's your faith. You've got to go back and pay attention to what's been laid before. Remember, I made the point last week that when the Bible was written, there weren't any chapters. There weren't any verses. That came along in the 1500s or 1600s or even maybe later than that. It was a long time, but it was, it was a letter. Now, if you sit down and write a letter to your mom or your dad or whoever, do you start chapter one, verse one, hi mom, verse two, how you do? No, of course not. You write a letter. These were letters. 
These were letters to a church. There weren't verses in here. So you have to pay attention to how the context flows, how the paragraphs flow. And that's why I'm trying to break each of these sections down as a separate paragraph. Every time we're looking at, at something, we're breaking it down into paragraphs. And so that's where all of these headings are. So when you get the outline at the end, you'll be able to go back and you'll see where they are. And you can actually, I have marks in my Bible where the paragraph starts, where it ends. So you can see that section of thought. But you still have to take it in the context of the, of the, whole, of the whole study. Um, now, the first thing I want you to see here, this Abrahamic promise... The promise that he should be heir of the world, okay, this was a promise. A promise. God made a promise to Abraham, and Abraham believed him. Okay? It was a promise, and it, was, it comes by the righteousness of faith and not by the law. Now, this can only be the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Because that's the only faith that brings about right, the righteousness of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. We don't need to turn there. We've looked at it a bunch of times already, but feel free to go take a look. So this righteousness is the righteousness of God. The statement righteousness of faith, we see this repeated over and over and over again in Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 4. And it always refers to the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at it. Romans 3.22 says this, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Philippians 3.9 points out that that is the faith that brings, a, that, that, that when you see verses that are talking about faith and righteousness, that, that it's the faith of Christ that we're talking about. Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that, your own righteousness, which, will, how, how, how does that come about? Righteousness by the law. What is that? Well, that's doing something. That's working. That's doing some sort of an activity. Any righteousness that would come by doing some sort of an activity is righteousness by the law. So the righteousness of God doesn't come by you doing any activity. It comes based on unmerited favor. So not having, flip back here so I don't misread it. Be found in him not having mine own righteousness, not doing something, which is of, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, Christ's faith, the righteousness of God, the, or the righteousness which is of God by faith. There's your proof text. That's the righteousness of God, the one that comes by the faith of Jesus Christ. Every time you see faith and righteousness in a passage that's dealing with the righteousness of God, it's talking about Christ's faith. You don't get that righteousness by exercising yours. And you cannot exercise yours unless you are already a partaker of the righteousness of God. By the time you get around to believe in God, it's too late to get saved. You're already saved. You wouldn't believe him otherwise. Okay? Um, and then Galatians chapter 3. We'll look at one more. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22. Galatians 3.22, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The promise. Remember, we're talking about a promise. God made a promise that Abraham would be the heir of the world. Promises aren't conditions. If I promise you something, that's a pro Now, am I going to keep my word or not? That's the question. But if I make you a promise that I'm going to do something, I'm the one doing it, not you. If I come along and say, you know what, if you'll do this, then I'll give you that, that's conditional. But if I come along and say, I promise to give you X, that's not conditional. I just made a promise to you that I was going to do it. Now, can you trust me to do it? Abraham trusted God and believed that what God told him he could pull off. So the question is, do you believe God as well? 
When you read this book, do you believe what he says? Do you believe the promises in here? If you do, then that's an evidence that you have the same faith that Abraham had. Make sense? Okay. Um, now the reason that the promise can't be conditional is explained in verses 14 and 15. It says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Okay? The purpose of the law was never for somebody to save themselves and get righteous. That was never... Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been driving on, say, Interstate 4 out here where the speed limit's 70 miles an hour and you're doing 70 miles an hour, right? And you look in your rear view mirror and there's a state trooper behind you with his lights on and he pulls you over and he walks up to your car and gives you a present because you were doing the speed limit. Anybody ever had that happen? Hmm? Laws work wrath. Now you get out on Interstate 4 and do 90 miles an hour and you're likely to have a state trooper behind you and he'll give you a present. But it's called a ticket and a summons and you either go to court or pay a big fine. That's what laws do. Laws control what you do which is wrong. They don't reward you for doing good. You're expected to do good. Now, the, the problem with mankind is that man is so depraved that he can't do good. But no law was ever written as some way to give you a present for keeping it. That's not what the, that's not what the law was designed for. The law can be summed up in one word. Guilty. Guilty, 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 all the way around the room. Guilty. You're guilty of it. That's what the law says. Paul says, I wouldn't know, have known sin had I not known, had I not had the law. How do you know when, how do you know that there's something you shouldn't do? Because the Bible says don't do it. That's, that's what the law was. It works wrath. It doesn't, it doesn't bring about righteousness. It was never set up for that reason. It was perverted into an idea that somehow we can keep it and therefore we can become righteous. But that's not what the law was ever intended for. Romans chapter 3 verses 19 through 20 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, you wouldn't know that it was wrong to do some of the things that the law says are wrong if you didn't have the law pointing it out and saying that's wrong, you shouldn't do that. That's what the law was. But it was never designed as some method to all of a sudden get righteous. It says in verse 14 through 15, for, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Why? First, because faith and works don't mix. They don't mix. They're like oil and water. Have you ever noticed like every once in a while you'll have a tanker will sink or there'll be some sort of a catastrophe and you end up with an oil slick floating on the top of the water out in the Gulf somewhere, right? It doesn't mix. It floats around on top. And they can go out there and circle it and get it and get the oil, collect the oil back because it won't mix with water. Try it at home sometime. Fill a glass up with, with, with halfway with water and then pour a bunch of oil in it. And watch what happens. The oil's going to go up to the top. It doesn't mix. Faith and works don't mix. Grace and works don't mix. Um, look, at, um, look at Romans chapter um, 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. 
Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. It can't be both. They don't mix. Grace and works don't mix. So if you want to take the position that you're saved by works, like so many churches do, there's a bazillion churches out there for you to go join, but you can't then start saying, well, I'm saved by grace, because you aren't. If you believe you're saved by works, then you believe you're saved by works. If you believe you're saved by grace, which means unmerited favor, then you can't be working to get it, because then it would be merited favor, wouldn't it? Unmerited favor means you didn't do anything to get it. It was a gift. It was given to you because, quite frankly, God felt sorry for you. So here you go. And there's a whole bunch of folks out there that, he, that he'll deal with on themselves later when the time rolls around. Okay. Um, so works is putting forth effort. Look at Romans chapter 9. Or, uh, yeah, Romans chapter 9 and verse 11. We've, we've looked at this one before, but it really it's really important to, to hang on to this. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. Any good or evil, those are works. This is not of works, the children hadn't done any good or evil. And it's not of works. Well, is believing in Jesus Christ good? Yeah, God commands it. But it's a work, because it's something that you do. And election isn't based on something that you do. It's not based on works. It's based on grace. And if it's based on something you do, then it's based on works, and it's not grace. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, again, works is putting forth effort to earn something. Grace is unmerited or unearned favor, and they are mutually exclusive by definition. You can't earn grace because grace is unearned favor. You can't earn it. We looked at, an, at, a, at a passage earlier here in Romans chapter 4 where it says that if Abraham were justified by works, um, he... Uh, no, that, that let, let, let me read it. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you're going to take the position that, that eternal life comes by keeping some sort of a condition, that God gave a condition for you to keep, and you then keep the com condition and therefore earn earn the, the, the salvation, then that's a matter of debt. It's not grace. God owes it to you. If God says, do this, I'll give you that, and you do it, he owes it to you. That's a matter of debt. That's not grace. That's not unmerited favor. And second, because the law worketh wrath. Its purpose is to condemn people, not to bring righteousness. So if you're going to make salvation by the law, then you're going to have to make the promise in none effect. And as we continue, you'll see, you'll see how much even more that fills in. Um, if we can go out and earn grace, then it doesn't have to be by the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, does it? If there's a condition that you can meet in order to get eternal salvation, Jesus Christ didn't have to die on a cross. Why did he have to come down here? Couldn't God just say, go collect seven green tree frogs and I'll give you eternal life? Why do you need Jesus Christ if all you gotta do is go collect tree frogs? Why do you, why do you need if, if any kind of, why would, why would that be the case? Because the only way to pay for, this, for our sins, blood has to be shed. And it has to be shed by somebody. You can't pay the price. Because you're a sinner. It's got to be paid by somebody that isn't a sinner. And there haven't been any of them since, other than Christ since Adam and Eve were first formed in the Garden of Eden. And they didn't last a day. Okay, so... 
So if that were the case, if, if, if righteousness did not come by the faith of Jesus Christ, but it came by the goodness of us through our own personal obedience, which, by the way, is taught in about 98 to 99 percent of the churches out there, then that's contrary to the faith of Jesus. Remember, we're talking about the faith of Christ here. In context, we're talking about his faith. So his faith would be void and of no effect if you can go save yourself some other way. Do you, you see the point? That's why the promise would be of none effect and the faith would be made void. It's not talking about your faith, it's talking about his. There'd be no purpose for him to do that if God could have just made some sort of condition. The Apostle Paul said in one place that if, that if righteousness could have been by the law, then it should have been. But it can't be. There's no law that you can keep to make yourself righteous. It takes the blood of someone else to make you righteous. You can't pay that price. Christ could and did. Okay. All right. Verses 16 and 17. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. Whose faith again? Christ's faith. It is of Christ's faith that it might be by God's grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. All the seed. Let that sink in for a minute. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now, this verse is one of two verses that is used by free willers to try to twist things around and make the faith yours. Ephesians 2.8 is the other one. For, for by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. Um, and I've preached on that before and showed that that's, that also is talking about Jesus Christ's faith, as is this passage. Um, but this is one that they try to do that, but it hangs up on something. Their position is that Jesus Christ died for every human being without exception, the entire human race. That makes the entire human race the seed. Now, how in the world can a free will conditional system make a promise sure to all the seed if it's conditional? It can't. God's promise is sure to all the seed. We're not talking about the seed of Adam. We're talking about a different seed. And if you want to know what that is, flip over quickly to Galatians. Getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Galatians, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. This is the seed under consideration. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The seed are those that were given to Christ before the foundation of the world, whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life, and the promise is sure to all of them. Free willer can't get around that one. There's no way in the world that you can make something conditional and then make it apply to every human being without, because that's what, what, it, that's what it would have to mean. That would have to mean that if, if eternal salvation is, is by free will and is based upon your action as a free will teaches, um, you take this verse to its logical conclusion and hell's going to be empty. Because the promise is sure to all the seed. So if the seed is the entire human race, everybody's going to heaven. And we know that's not true. Because we read in Revelation, all those people that are judged by their works are thrown into the lake of fire. They're not going to heaven. 
But if you look at this from a standpoint that the seed is the seed of, a of, of Abraham, all of those that are in Christ, then the promise is sure to all of them. Not one of them, not one of them will be lost. Christ said, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will that's of him that sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. All the seed, the promises to all of them, and it's sure to all of them. Now, how do you make sure that something is sure to everybody? What's well, easy? You know, you know how I make sure that something gets done? I do it. If I want to be absolutely positive that something is going to get done, I go do it. That way I know it got done. And it's the same way with God. If God wants to make sure that his promise comes about and is fulfilled, God goes out and does it. He fulfills it. It's no different than us. I mean, if I want the lawn mowed tomorrow, and I know the guy that mows my lawn shows up about once every six months, and I want it, I'm going to go mow it. I have to. That's the only way that I can make sure that it gets done. And it's the same way with God. And that's how God deals with, with eternal salvation. So that the, all of the seed is covered. He did it. Like the song says, Jesus paid it all. He didn't pay part of it. He did all of it. He took care of it. Um, and notice it says here that it, it is of faith and by grace. And let me repeat, it's only the faith of Jesus Christ can, that can be directly taken to be grace. Yours isn't. Your faith isn't, can't be taken as grace. His can. Um, if it's our faith, then what we do is grace, and that's just stupid. Right? If I exercise my faith and then therefore I'm saved by my grace? <laughs> really? I go to heaven because of uh, what a gracious guy I am. <laughs> Shame I'm not going to do it for anybody else because I want to be up there by myself. But, but see, I exercise my faith and that's grace and so now I go to heaven based on me. That just made me God. You see, it's stupid. It makes no sense. Um, now, it is true that the ability to exercise faith is a gift of grace. But it's also a commandment. 1 John, chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3, and verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And you know, a lot of people get hung up on that love one another thing, and they think that's some sort of touchy-feely, emotional kind of a love. And that's not what that's talking about. The love of God is to keep his commandments. That's what the love of God is. You can love somebody biblically and really not like them very much. That's possible to do that. It's, it, it is. Don't lie to them. Don't cheat them. Don't steal from them. Don't take advantage of them. Treat them the way that you would expect to be treated, and you're loving them, even though you might not really care for them all that much. But you can still love them according to the Bible. That's the love of God. Um, so many people get hung up on this idea that it's got to be some sort of, sort of an emotional, fluffy bunny thing, to, to quote our friend over here. Um, and that's not what God's love is anyway. It's keeping the commandments towards one another. That's the love of God. So again, you can love somebody and still not hang out with them much. You don't have to like them. You have to love them. That's the commandment. So don't break God's commandments concerning people. Um, but think about this for a minute. If you're able to keep this commandment, if you have the, and I said this before, if you have the ability to do something, it means you have the ability to do it, right? You don't get the ability to do something by having the ability to do it. If you have the ability, you've already got it. 
And so if you are able to keep this commandment, this is his commandment that ye believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ. If you can do that, then that means you have the ability to do it, and that means you're born again. Because you have to be born again to believe that. So how, how could you get born again by believing it when you have to be born again in order to believe it? If you can, can keep the commandment, that's an evidence that you're one of God's children and you're born again. And notice to the, again, to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. God wants to make sure and certain that every one of his elect children will be with him in heaven. And this is the only way that he can make certain that all of them will be there by him doing the work. Make sense? Now the free will system, what we argue with all the time, they, they think that Christ died for the entire human race and that makes the entire human race the seed. And it teaches that the promise is conditional only to the part of the seed that accepts it and it's void to the rest, but that's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible says it's sure to all the seed. Um, the Bible also teaches that Christ died only for the elect, and that's the seed. And as I said over in Galatians, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's how you know that you're the heir, if you're Christ. Well, how do you know if you're Christ? By walking in the steps of our father Abraham. You see how it all comes back around full circle again. And the longer that you stay faithful and the longer that you practice, because you know what, even Abraham made some mistakes. We'll get into a couple of those here in a minute. He goofed a few times. We all goof, we all sin, but he got up and dusted himself off and started walking again. And the more we follow the teaching, the more evidence we have. The more evidence we have, the stronger our faith becomes. We, you know, it, it uh, when I was a new Christian, it didn't take much to knock me off course. Over a period of years, you start to see, you know what, God actually has been here. He's actually gotten me through a lot of stuff. Over 30 something years, I would hope that my faith's a little stronger now. It takes a little bit longer to break me than it used to takes, you know, I can hang with it a little longer than I could 30 years ago. Um, and that's growth, and that's what you look for. And the only way you get there is by continually being tested, continually waiting, you know, the, I think it was last week that I made the point about patience, that we have to grow in patience. And, and usually it's just about the time where you've lost your patience that the answer comes. And if you, if you have to have the answer immediately when you pray for it, because you don't have enough patience to last more than a couple of minutes, you're pretty weak. It's not going to take much to knock you off. That's exactly the type that the devil's sitting out there looking for. You know, the, the Bible likens him to a roaring lion. You know what lions do just before they get their prey? They roar at them startles them, scares them. Look at a deer in the headlights, they stop. They'll be in the middle of the highway as you're driving down the road and they'll all of a sudden see your headlights and rather than run out of the highway, which is the smart thing to do, they stop and stare at you as you plow into them and total your car. Okay, and that's what, now there's your prey of the lion so the lion roars at him. Now, which one does he chase? Does he chase the strongest one in the field? No, he can't catch the strongest one in the field for more than just a couple of seconds. Gazelles are quick, but you find the weak one and you roar at it and you just got lunch. And that's what the devil does. He looks for the weak ones and he roars at them and then he devours them. And how many of them have we seen that come through here and not too long later they've been eaten by the been eaten by a lion and they're gone. So the only way to avoid that is to continue to work 
continue to follow Abraham, continue to hold out and grow in patience and grow in faith and grow in grace and grow in all of those gifts. And then you're one of the stronger ones. It's harder to knock you off. That's why, that's why there's a verse that says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't worry about everybody else. Don't spend, don't spend a minute. That's my job. I have to worry about everybody in here. You don't. You've got to worry about yourself. You just worry about you and don't worry about everybody else. You know, the, the person sitting across the aisle from you, they're not your concern. Now, if they have a problem and you can help them, then help them. But don't spend your time worrying about them. That's the thing that usually sends a message to the devil that, hey, I got a weak one over here. And he comes looking. So work out your own salvation. And if a brother comes to you with a problem, try to help him. But if he doesn't, leave him be. Okay? Um, boy, I got, off, I got off the line on that one, huh? Um, anyway, we don't have to worry about all the seed of Abraham. We only have to worry about the seed of Ab, uh, of, or not. We don't have to worry about the seed of Adam. We have to worry about the seed of Abraham. And God's already taken care of that. And it doesn't matter if they're Jews or Gentiles, if they're circumcised or uncircumcised, it makes no difference. If they're Christ's, then the price has been paid. Now, verse 17. It says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. There's a line of thinking that some Baptists have gotten themselves into. Presbyterians follow this line of thinking. Muslims follow this line of thinking. Um, and it's referred to as absolute predestination. They believe that the only way that God can control the affairs of men is if he has absolutely fixed every action that anyone is ever going to do and so he's set it in stone and and you're a puppet you're nothing more than a puppet you see this is why terrorists can blow people up and say God made me do it because that's what they believe they believe that even their wicked actions were caused by God forcing them to do it. That's absolute predestination. That gets them out of their responsibility. They act, those folks in the Middle East actually believe that God made them walk into a synagogue with a bomb strapped around them and blow up those people and kill them. And Presbyterians believe the same thing. There's a whole bunch of other Christians that believe the same thing. And they'll hang their hat on this verse. But that's not how it works. Now, I don't want to get so far afield that I'm, that I'm teaching a lesson on the providence of God. I've done that before. The way that God can control the affairs of mankind and yet not be the author of sin is by knowing what, what choices you have and letting you have the, the free will to make the choice. Okay, um, Elder Gerald used to liken this to a cow in a field with a fence around him. He can go anywhere he wants to go, or she, cow, right? She can go anywhere she wants to go within that fence, but she can't go outside of the fence. Okay, now, if there's a gate here and a gate here and both of the gates are open, the cow can walk through whichever gate the cow wants to walk through, right? One of those gates might be good, one might be evil, but the cow makes a decision as to which gate it goes through. And if it goes through the gate that's evil, then it's going to be walking on rocks for a while before it sees any more grass. And if it goes through the gate that's good, then it's, it leads right into the next pasture. God can arrange the affairs of your life in such a way that he knows all of the possible outcomes in advance of what can and would happen if you walk through that gate. 
Okay? Now, there are some gates that he does not want you to go through. There are some things that he's going to keep from you. You're never going to see that gate. That gate's closed. He protects people that way. Because if we were left to do whatever we wanted to do, we'd all be a mess. So there's certain ones that you're just never going to see it. But then the others, when you do come up to a fork in the road and you have a decision to make, that's your decision to make. Now you can choose to do good or you can choose to do evil. There might be seven choices that are good and one that's bad. Your choice to make. Okay? If you always choose good, then that will lead to the next choice. If you choose bad, you're going to go through some trouble for a while and then you'll finally come to another choice. And hopefully over the course of a lifetime, you learn that it's best if I choose good rather than choosing bad. And in doing so, God can absolutely control what goes on down here and yet you're morally responsible for your actions. That's the only way that it can work and God not be the author of sin. He's in control. He knows what will happen. He allows you the latitude to do certain things, not everything, because if it's something that he did absolutely... Take an example of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He brought Christ into the world at a time when the form of capital punishment was to crucify somebody. He didn't bring him into the world in the 20th century where they could have laid him on a table and given him a shot. You know, where now we have what lethal injection for capital. No, he brought him around, brought him into, into the world at the time where the only choice that they had for capital punishment was crucifixion because they had already taken away the Jews' right to stone people. That was illegal. The Romans were the ones that had to take care of capital punishment. The Romans were the ones that crucified people. The Jews used to stone folks. I mean, you can see that in the example of Stephen. They completely lost their mind and stoned him. That was the way that they did it in those days. But when it came to Christ, it had to happen the way that God had prophesied it would happen for thousands of years, so he brought him into existence at the time when that was the only option available. The Jews had one other option. They could have said no and let him go. There is always an option to do the right thing. Always. Therefore, you can't blame God for making the decision that turned out to be bad. There is always an option to do good. So therefore, you're more morally responsible for what you do that's bad, because you didn't have to do it. And God didn't force you to do it. You made the decision, and you'll pay the price for it. Here, or you'll pay the price later, one or the other. But that's the, that's the, see, so man has enough freedom to be morally responsible to God for his actions, and yet no man has enough freedom to destroy the purposes of God. And that's the only way that that will work. So when you run across one of these, these you know, there's a, well, I'll get to that later. There's, um, you may run across, some, there are some primitive Baptists that buy into the whole absolute thing. Um, and like I say, Presbyterians, Muslims, um, there are a number of religions that, that's, that's the way they try to explain. And then when you, when you ask them the point about, well, how does that not make God an author of sin if he forced you to sin? Well, then they come back with the famous, well, it's a mystery. Well, it's not a mystery. It's, it's a heresy. That's not how it works. Okay. Um, okay. Verses 18 through 22. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, 
and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Oh, and verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. There's that word again. Um, Picture Abraham. Abraham was, at this point, was about 100 years old. He had lost the ability to father children. It happens to old guys. After a while, you just it doesn't work anymore, right? Um, Sarah had never been able to carry a child. She was barren. So you have Abraham, a man who can no longer father children, and Sarah, a woman who could never have children. And God makes a promise that out of him, he will be the father of many nations. At which point Sarah laughed. I probably would have laughed too. And and God called her on it. He said, why'd you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, yeah, you did. Um, Now, prior to this, they had become Arminians for a while. Abraham and, and Sarah had become Arminians for a while. And they decided that they were going to help God. So since Sarah couldn't have children, she gave Abraham her handmaid for him to lie with and impregnate her. And then that could be the, that could be the promised child. And there we, we'll help God out. Right? Because God can't pull this off by himself because I can't have kids. So, so we'll just we'll do it this way. So they did it that way. And... and um, and after a few years, God came along and said, yeah, that ain't it. Not taking him. That's not the one. You know? And so God does what God usually does when people try to help him. He lets him wait for another 25 years. You know? My advice, don't try to help him. Because it can be a long lesson. He let him wait until now he's so old he can't father children and Sarah can't either. And he's still making this promise that eventually you're going to have a kid. Okay, um, so what happened? Well, God restored Abraham's ability to father children, and he opened Sarah's womb so that she could bear a child, and lo and behold, this old man of over a hundred and his wife of nearly the same age, she comes up pregnant with Isaac. She named him Isaac because Isaac actually means laughter in, in Hebrew because she laughed when, when, when they were told. Now, now here's, here's, the, here's, here's the hooker on this. God tells Abraham, you're going to be a father when Abraham couldn't father children anymore and his wife couldn't have children and God says, you're going to be a father And Abraham did what? He believed him. He believed God. He believed that God was able to do whatever he had to do to bring about a promise that he made to him. That's the faith of Abraham. At the point at which man can do absolutely nothing, God acts. And Abraham believed that he could do it. And he did it. And he brought about Isaac. Now, how is it that we become Abraham's children? Isaac became Abraham's children through a miraculous work of God when man was unable to do anything about it. How do we become Abraham's children? Remember, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. How is it that that we do that, we're going to see it when we get a little bit longer. The same way. We become the children of God the same way that Isaac did. Through a miraculous work of God by taking someone that is dead and bringing them back to life again. Because when you're in sin, you're dead. You're a corpse. You have no ability to do anything. And God breathes life back into you changes your heart, puts a spirit in you. The same type of activity that he did 
with Abraham to restore him so that he could have children. He restored you so that you could be one of his children. And God did all the work. What man cannot do by his own activity and works, God does by his grace. That's sovereign grace. That's how it works. Okay? Um, verses 21 and 22. We looked at this quickly. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. You see, that belief that Abraham had showed that Abraham was righteous. It didn't make him righteous. He had been righteous for years before that came about. But the fact but, but that was imputed to him. That was counted as righteousness. That was the evidence that Abraham was righteous. Um, and it, it says in, in verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Um, Remember this, if you can exercise faith, then you have faith, right? It would be really hard for someone that doesn't have a right arm to be able to do curls with their right arm and exercise that arm if they don't have it, right? That'd be a, that, that would be a magician's show. Somebody that doesn't have arms can now all of a sudden lift a barbell with their arms that they don't have. If you have the ability to do that, it proves that you have the arm. If you have the ability to exercise faith, it proves that you have faith. And if you have faith, you're a child of God. You're like Abraham. You're one of his children. Um, let me see if I can wrap this. Okay, verses 23 through 25. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Oh, one other thing I want you to look at here in verse 18. Let me go back to that briefly. It says, who against hope believed in hope, okay? Who against hope of the flesh believed in hope of God. That's what that's referring to. He didn't have any faith in his flesh anymore. He couldn't bear children. But he believed in hope based on what God had promised. So that's what that who against hope believed in hope is referring to. Okay. Um, verse 23. Okay, not written for... It was not written... For his sake alone. Why was Abraham able to, to believe God in the first place? Because God had already made him a righteous man by an act of grace. That's why he could believe him. And what did Abraham believe when God made promises? Abraham believed God would perform the promises that he made. And he believed that he was able to perform the promises that he made. And so if you believe that God can perform the promises that he makes, then you have the same faith. And that type of faith makes you act on it. Because if you believe it, then you act on it. Okay? Um, So our belief, just like Abraham's belief, is not what makes us righteous, but it shows that God's already performed and he's already made us righteous. And our belief and our response is the evidence of that new birth, not the cause of it. Now let's get down to this last verse and we'll wrap up with this. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. What in the world does that mean? Raised, uh, he was delivered for our offenses. There are there are those that take this, they'll, they'll take this term, this, this, um, the, the for our justification, justification, and they'll take the, now, the word for, you know, we teach primary meanings, the word for has, I don't know how many definitions, 
Go look it up in a dictionary. It's page after page after page after page. This word has all kinds of definitions behind it, okay? So some people will take this and say that the four in the justification was he was raised again in order that we could be justified. That's the way they'll, and that's a definition of the word for. But that doesn't fit the context. Because if, if he was raised again in order that we could be justified, then he was delivered in order that we could be condemned. Right? It's the same word. If he was, who was delivered in order that we, for, in order for our offenses, that means that Christ was crucified so that we could be condemned, and that doesn't make sense. There is, however, a definition of the word for that makes perfect sense, but it doesn't make perfect sense if you're a free willer. It doesn't real work real well with them, but it does make perfect sense, and the word for means because of. He was delivered because of our offenses. Now, does that make sense? Yeah, that's why he went to the cross, because of our offenses, wasn't it? And he was raised again because of our justification. That doesn't help a free willer, does it? You see, he came out of the grave because we were justified, because he'd paid the price. He was delivered because of our offenses, he was raised again because of our justification. When he was on the cross and he uttered those words, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, at that moment, all of God's children, the, the legal justification had been paid for them. Now, it didn't apply to you yet because you weren't born yet, but the price was already paid. It was already taken care of. And that's the reason that God raised him from the dead. Had he not raised him from the dead, you'd still be in your sins. But the fact that he did raise him from the dead proves that you're not because he was raised again because of our justification. Okay? Um, it's kind of like... If you were to say, you know what, the ground's wet for it just rained. Well, it's not wet in order that it could rain, right? It's wet because it did rain. So that, that word does make sense that way, and that's, and that's what we're talking about in that passage. So Christ was delivered because of our offenses. He was raised again because of our justification, and that justification was taken care of then. It's not taken care of by you in this life. It was taken care of 2,000 years ago on the cross and then it applies to you at some point during your life. With that, I, I think we, we've gotten all the way through chapter 4. So I thank you for your kind and patient attention, and uh, when we come back to this again, we'll, we'll, start, on, we'll start on chapter 5. Um, chapter 5 is, is titled, The Believer Standing in Grace, and so this will be a little bit of a switch. So let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.